Ruskin. I'm a managing consultant with Spine Communications. Uh, today we're going to be talking about B2B. Uh, is this better? So, my name is Vladis Demelski. I'm with Spine Communications. Today we're going to be talking about B2B, which is vehicle to vehicle communications. Uh, so, important to note, none of our research was car specific. We specifically tried to stay car agnostic and talk about the protocols and uh, features that need to be implemented in the B2B. Uh, so, started out as a government pipe dream uh, with lots of good intentions, like many government programs. Uh, all these vehicles are driving down the road in orderly fashion, uh, communicating and sharing information about their directions, speed of travel, uh, in some cases destination, uh, and in many cases the number of occupants in the vehicle. So, I did mention this was a government effort, so uh, if there was room for one standard, there's room for lots and lots of standards. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but these are actually some of the most prevalent standards that seem to be winning out at the moment. Uh, right now, uh, in 2016, uh, there is supposed to be one vehicle coming out with a B2B implementation. Uh, so that means that the only B2B that you currently see on the roads are research and uh, prototypes and pre-production prototypes. Uh, what you see on the right is actually a test bed uh, for one of the American manufacturers uh, laid out. Uh, several hardware computers, uh, several radio modules, as well as a radar, uh, radar module. Uh, so the concept is fairly simple. Uh, several vehicles are going down the highway. Uh, if one vehicle detects an obstacle, either using the radar sensors, uh, LiDAR sensors, or camera sensors, it sends the information down the highway. Uh, the leading cause of pileups uh, and traffic jams is one vehicle slamming the brakes and they continue to accelerate, and that creates a ripple effect down the highway until the vehicles come to a uh, standstill. So, by vehicles uh, towards the back knowing that, you know, about the obstacle and having the ability to change lanes in advance, it's just supposed to alleviate the congestion and avoid the uh, pileups. Uh, so, as you see in this well meaning picture, the vehicles are broadcasting not only obstacles but also lane changes and the location of the obstacle in relation to the vehicle. Uh, because as vehicles pass by the object or possibly hit it inadvertently, the object will move along the highway. So we get an object ID and it's tracked. So multiple cars are sending events about objects and making uh, vehicles behind them thinking there's multiple objects on the highway. Uh, so protocol spectrum. Right now we actually have two spectrums which are allocated for B2B. Uh, the AO2, the 11X, uh, so it, one is the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, which is where AO2, the 11 uh, frequencies operate, as well as the 4G spectrum. Uh, so right now it looks like they're in the middle of losing the 4G spectrum. Uh, it is not yet known if we will lose it or not. Uh, so within the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, things operate using the AO2, the 11X protocol. Uh, meaning that there's uh, quite a lot of possibility for reusing the current AO2 to the 11B chips. Uh, that also helps with that interoperability for AO2 to so interoperability with B2X, which is vehicle to infrastructure communication, and the ability for vehicles to interact with things such as traffic lights, uh, pedestrian cell phones, uh, etc. So, let's dive a little bit into the protocol. Uh, first and foremost, uh, just like your computer is an IP address, the vehicle has a unique identifier. And that obviously brings up privacy implications. Just like your iPhone constantly changing the, the advertiser ID to try and provide some anonymity, the vehicle is also supposed to change its unique identifier every 15 minutes. Uh, that's supposed to provide anonymity against tracking by individuals as well as advertisers. Now, I mentioned this is a mesh protocol, and it does not have any authentication. It does not have any verification. It does not have a time-based digest. Uh, the protocol is supposed to function sure or not first. Now, I say it's supposed to, uh, because not all vehicles are going to be equipped with it as it starts to roll out. As it starts to roll out to more and more vehicles, uh, more and more vehicles are going to be supporting it and rebroadcasting the mesh messages. 
Uh, now, there's also, uh, there are standards that will drop certain mesh nodes as they uh, as they're believed to misbehave or malfunction. However, there's uh, there are no standards that define what a malfunctioning node is or what a malicious node is. It's simply mentioned in the specs. But uh, I think we can figure out some behavior for malicious nodes. So, uh, this is an image of how it's supposed to function. If every vehicle on the highway is equipped with a B2B, uh, we have a nice orderly hop from a police vehicle that was pulled over all the way down the line up to the EMS that knows exactly the location of the pull over police vehicle. Uh, the reality is obviously not going to be so orderly. Uh, so, this is actually an example going down the highway. You see a special lane specifically for vehicles that are equipped with B2B, uh, highlighted in green, and blocked off from other cars. Uh, and cars broadcast uh, their location, uh, speed of travel, and the direction uh, to allow for uniform speed in those lanes. Now, it's interesting that uh, the VAB protocol also has specifications for off-roading. So those of you that go off-road, know that once you press the hill, oftentimes you lose radio communications with other cars unless you, uh, you have excellent antenna placement and they're using a lot of power on your CPU or hand radios. Now with uh, B2B communication and having mesh nodes that rebroadcast your messages, you're actually able to keep better track of your convoy and uh, know if there's a vehicle towards the back that possibly dropped off. So, Spoofing. Uh, it's an A2-day of an export wall with no built-in security controls. So we have all the typical A2-day of an B-based attacks, including malicious, including malicious nodes, uh, message replay, uh, being able to uh, proxy messages using SSL script, uh, simulating traffic jams by simulating a large number of vehicle identifiers in front of the vehicle using the same destination. Uh, some of these attacks can be used to reroute the target vehicles and also to, to cause the vehicles to come to a complete stop. So, I mentioned there's a lot of predefined messages within the B2B protocol. Uh, some are fairly straightforward. One warns about traffic jam in front of the vehicle within the same direction of travel. Another message is actually able to use the car's onboard diagnostics to detect that there is a large pothole uh, from shock events and from G sensor events. Uh, also using cameras or LiDAR in front of the vehicle. And it's able to broadcast information to the vehicles following the initial vehicle so that they know to change lanes or to avoid the pothole. Uh, there's some other more oddball messages, such as uh, government crew in progress, uh, nuclear attack in progress, and a biological attack in progress. Uh, there's actually quite a few others. Uh, some I really hope are test messages. Uh, so I'm gonna leave that as an exercise to you to look up what some of them are. Uh, if you were to broadcast some of these messages in front of a convoy, like let's say in front of a VIP convoy, uh, it might be interesting to gauge their uh, response. So that's just a little bit of uh, good DEF CON uh, advice for you. Now, pre-crash conditions. The vehicles that are currently on the road uh, only respond to certain events once their body senses are actually impacted. Uh, so even though they have early warning and collision systems, they can't start to deploy an airbag prior to a collision. They may warn you that a collision is imminent or likely, and then you'll get all sorts of warning lights along the dashboard, but that's all that there is. It's up to the human to try and avoid the collision. Uh, with b 2 it's actually possible to... So right now the airbag has two states, armed and disarmed. Once you start up the vehicle, unless you remove a certain uh, jumper, the airbag is armed. With B2B communication, the airbag actually has... Sorry, the airbag actually has two states, which is armed, disarmed, and pre-collision. Which means that uh, allow the voltages already redirected from other systems in the vehicle and redirected towards the airbag and other collision systems to get ready to, air, to let the airbag deploy. It also stops sending non-critical messages on the bus. So when the message to actually deploy the, air, the airbag comes through, it reaches the airbag that much faster. Which, and by that much faster, we mean uh, microseconds. Uh, so 
so seatbelt tension. Uh, right now they have seatbelts only tension up when you actually apply tension to them. So for example, if you yank yeah, their uh, seatbelt, you know that provides additional resistance. Um, with a pre-collision state, the seatbelt can actually tighten up in order to take up the slack in the seatbelt to restrain the occupant of the vehicle. There's two interesting protocols. Uh, one is for airbags. They're meant to catch bicycles in front of the vehicle and also to catch pedestrians in front of the vehicle. So even though we can't deploy the airbag within the passenger cabin without an actual collision, we can deploy the airbag in front of the vehicle just by sending pre-collision messages and making the vehicle think it's about to make a collision without physically interacting with the vehicle. Uh, there's also provision in the protocol for what's known as V2X, uh, which is vehicle interacting with infrastructure. Part of that infrastructure are pedestrians and bicyclists with their cell phone beacon turned on, broadcasting their here right now and their location. So the vehicles uh, traveling down the highway know that there's an obstacle to hopefully to the side of that road and know to either slow down or change lanes to avoid obstacles. Now another protocol actually supports braking by wire and and steering by wire. That means that you're able to possibly get a vehicle to slow out of our lane or even spur into a lane that has another vehicle to minimize the risk or minimize the damage of an imminent collision. So like any peer-to-peer -peer protocol, we have a large number of nodes and we know precious little about those actual nodes. Uh, the only information that we really know is the information that we choose to provide about themselves or claim to provide about themselves. That leaves an opening for malicious actors. We can actually receive a message that would typically be too far away for other vehicles to receive, modify it, and, appear that, uh, and make it appear for the message to have come from your vehicle. So for example, we can make it appear as if your vehicle is traveling in the opposite direction and impact some of the payment systems such as the easy pass systems and the way you're built for them. Uh, we can generate our own malicious messages. We make it look like there's a traffic jam uh, or that the highway is built to make the target vehicle redirect somewhere else. Uh, we can actually close down a tunnel or a bridge by making it appear there's accidents on the bridge and getting emergency services and trying to divert vehicles in a different direction. Just like any radio protocol, you can also conduct RF jamming, meaning no useful messages get out from the surrounding vehicles or from a certain geographical location. Meaning all the smart vehicles essentially bail back over to dumb vehicles with no intermediate communication. So now we're getting into slightly more advanced attacks. It's actually possible to create radar signatures using a hacker app and make the vehicles in the highway believe that there's something in front of them that's not actually there. So if uh, we were to place two hacker apps and a controlling computer on an overpass, we could slow down the highway because vehicles that use radar, radar sensing uh, will be broadcasting there's an obstacle for anyone that will likely stop or swerve to avoid an obstacle. Now, we can record radar signatures of known obstacles, such as a stop truck, and playing back along the highway. Uh, this gives us a nice baseline instead of us trying to figure out what it looks like to a particular vehicle when there's an obstacle in front of it. We can record the temperature and play back. Now, there's one very popular Ford car uh, that uses a, a, a camera system as opposed to a radar system uh, for crash avoidance. Uh, we actually know that it's possible to create shadows intentionally for vehicle overpasses that make the car think there's something in front of it and cause those vehicles to come to a stop. So, uh, in this scenario, we, we make the, vehicle, the blue vehicle believe that there is an accident in front of the yellow vehicle so we can get the blue vehicle in this diagram to come to a complete stop just by playing back uh, certain radio signatures to make it think that there's an obstacle in front of it. 
Now, I did touch upon vehicle uh, material infrastructure a little bit. Uh, that's not the focus of this talk, but just wanted to give a quick overview. Uh, since I did mention we have not lost the 4G spectrum yet, they're actually able to communicate long distances and use the cell phone towers to communicate with traffic lights and infrastructure control centers. They're very remote from the high where the vehicles are actually traveling. So it doesn't just have to be a local mesh network. It could actually be part of a larger mesh network that expands the globe, as long as we don't use the 4G spectrum. So, none of the things that they're talking about are actually weaknesses within any particular vehicle that we're testing. These are all actually protocol weaknesses. Uh, some, uh, some vehicles use wire systems to detect objects in front of them, some use radar, some use cameras, and if all these vehicles were to have BTV on them, uh, it's not known which control would be the overriding control. So, BTV system is telling there's an object in front of them, but the camera system is telling there's an object in front of them. We don't know if the vehicle is going to try and avoid the collision or if the vehicle is going to try and accelerate or travel at normal speed uh, down the highway. So, the, it's very likely that if we got to do a this in different ways because the standard doesn't currently define which the protocol is currently over and above all. So this is a good example of where the wider system is supposed to be covered. Uh, it's supposed to give us close to 360 degree view. Uh, the camera system is very important on some of the uh, uh, some of the media and the trucks actually give us something very similar to the 360 degree. It's called bird eye view. However, if you view the top version off the front of it, it might still be over it. So, consequences. The consequences are obviously not just that people are coming to a complete stop and there's no option on it. Uh, consequences could be a full head-on collision because the vehicle failed to yield to another car or worse yet, two cars on the highway fail to realize that they're in a collision path or two cars within an intersection and the human failed to intervene. Uh, when both vehicles are traveling in the same direction, it's actually quite a bit easier for one to get one vehicle to not detect the braking event from the vehicle in front of it, and obviously it cause a very large pileup. Uh, we can actually create this by keeping bad data within the mesh network, and eventually the cars within the local mesh network are going to stop trusting the mesh messages, and they're going to fall back to whatever crash reporting systems they have on board, and not rely on the infrastructure. Some of these technologies are coming not just to passenger vehicles. Uh, some of the big work trucks are actually leading the way for EV uh, communications and for crash avoidance systems. Uh, the reasons for that are uh, several. One is fuel savings. But being able to trip behind another, they can achieve significant fuel savings. Uh, the numbers I've seen are around 10 to 50 percent fuel savings by traveling less than 40 feet behind the other truck. Uh, driving costs. By using unmanned trucks, they're able to save on labor costs, and they're also able to travel for a longer number of hours without having to have the human driver pull over and stop, uh, which is currently mandated. Uh, so right now, the truckers can only get over a certain number of hours before they stop the speed or for a rest stop. Uh, so this is a diagram of uh, how the radars are uh, working several trucks. Uh, the truck, the second truck in line, the one that's driven behind the first truck, is using a radar system to keep the appropriate distance in front of the median vehicle. Uh, it's trying to do not fall back too far to actually take advantage of the fuel savings, uh, and it's trying to obviously not uh, rear end the truck in front of it. Are there any questions that I can answer 